as Susan said, I am Nancy Lockwood, and I do do the voter service for the League of Women Voters. And I want to thank Susan and her library staff, and also the youth, I think, are responsible for getting <coughs> the chairs and tables set up. There's a very active um, young adult group that meets here, a teenage group that helped and have for several years now. So, so we're very appreciative. Um, before we get started with your questions for the Wyoming State Senate and Representative candidates, I'd like to go over some general information with you. Um, on the back table, or tables, there's two of them, there are some brochures regarding the League of Women Voters and membership information there. Uh, we generally have a book for you to purchase that's called The Look of Wyoming, but I understand they're not here yet. <laughs> So if they don't make it tonight, they will be at our next two forums. So then you can purchase those books for $10. They're, uh, they're an excellent guide to anything you want to know about Wyoming government, um, a historical perspective up to current day or as current as when the publication date was for it, which I think is what, 2009, something like that, thereabouts. Also on the other back table, um, there is information that candidates have put. Um, their campaign literature, any statements that they wanted to provide about general information about who they are, why they're running, those sorts of things, and their copies for you to take with you. Uh, a couple other things. Um, uh, Susan already mentioned a few things, but the other is the primary election will be Tuesday, August 21, and polling places are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And as she said, you can vote early by going to the clerk's office or by requesting an absentee ballot. Um, the League, again, is putting out their voter guide. This will be published by the Daily or by the Boomerang's office in conjunction with the League, and it comes out on August 12. And it will also be posted on the League's website, and you can link to that from the State League's website. And if you want those links, I have them. I have them with me, and you can get them from me. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite any other candidates that are not running for state Wyoming House or Senate that might be here who want to at least stand up and give a howdy and a here I am and who I am. Just briefly introduce yourself and what office you're running for at this election. We have any other candidates here? I'm Tony Mendoza and I'm running in House District 45 and I appreciate your support on uh, November 6th. Thank you very much. Oh, you're going to give us another yeah. offer. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So hang on. <laughs> you get a little longer. I <laughs> see. We'll begin tonight's forum with the time for the state, Senate, and House candidates running unopposed in the primary to briefly introduce themselves. Following this, the candidates who have opposition, in this case, we have two, those in the <laughs> Republican primary for state, Senate, District 10, and they will have a chance to answer your questions. Questions are to be written down, and a league member will collect them from you and give them to the moderator. There are pencils and pads of paper, or in this case, library cards, <laughs> at each row of seats. Questions should be directed to the candidate's position, not towards a particular candidate. Each candidate will be given 90 seconds to respond to each question. And we do have a timekeeper. It's Carly. Can I stand up, Carly? Everybody knows you. There we go. And she's going to hold up a sign when you're approaching your time limit and at the conclusion of your time limit. The last 20 to 30 minutes of the forum, or whenever questions in, will be given over for, well, if earlier, we won't go longer than, than 8.30 to 8.45 thereabouts, will be given over for informal conversation with audience members. We ask that everyone help with stacking the chairs to provide more space and to help with the cleanup. And as Susan already mentioned, I want uh, the candidates to please remember to state your name when responding to the questions as these are being recorded, and also to use the microphones. And at this time, I will give a chance for those other candidates that are running for the Wyoming State House and Senate um, a chance to come up. They have, we asked, or we invited them to provide a two, up to two minute statement if they wanted to about themselves. And I don't have a particular order other than I was jotting names down here, so I, you, you get my, my randomization here. So Tim Nyquist. Who was I? Can you can borrow their mics up there. I 
think is that better for you for filming, or do you want him up here, Susan? I have him in my okay. sights. <laughs> I'm Tim Nyquist, running for House District uh, 14. I'm a Democrat, and uh, um, I'd like, number one, to just uh, quickly thank the, the uh, we, League of Women Voters, and I'd also uh, like to thank all the volunteers who uh, helped on our fire recently. Um, I basically decided to run because I'm very concerned about the loss of funding to our uh, education system. It seems like uh, uh, every year I see an 8% cut in funding. And uh, one of the things I'm a very strong advocate is to take care of uh, students of all ages, and I believe in all kinds of education. Um, I'm also a very a huge energy efficient nut and I believe that we can uh, help improve our economy through energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is one of the quickest ways to pay back uh, uh, renewable, uh, over -e renewable energy. Therefore, uh, we create lots of jobs at, and we improve uh, Wyoming's economy. Thank you. I'm running for House District 45. I've always been committed uh, to public service. I'm, I'm very interested in that. I feel like I have a special connection to the community. I was born in Laramie. I went to school here, uh, worked here. I'm currently employed at the Laramie Soup Kitchen and so on. I'm in touch with some of the social and economic kinds of issues facing our community. I'm also interested in funding education. I'm interested in developing uh, an energy resource that's clean for our environment, that protects our water and our air and our outdoor uh, facilities. And I'm also interested in honoring our promise to retirees in the state of Wyoming. Uh, those are just some of the issues that I'm concerned about. Uh, and I would appreciate your support on uh, November 6th. Thank you very much. Jerry Paxton and I am running for uh, House District uh, 47 as a Republican and uh, I, I'm kind of an interloper on your on Albany County because I really only have one little tiny corner of the county over by Rock River. Uh, if you're not familiar with District 47 it takes in the Rock River area all of Carbon County except for um, Sinclair and Rollins and it takes in about a third of uh, Sweetwater County, it goes up to the Sublet County line, includes uh, Farson and Eden, and so uh, I'm running unopposed because I think probably no one else wants the, the challenge of trying to cover that big an area, but uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I live over an encampment. I've been there 41 years. I was an educator, retired as a school principal in 2005, ran for county commissioner in 2006, was elected and this is my, I'm serving my second term as county commissioner. I've been heavily involved in public lands issues and I think one of the things I'm proudest of is the fact that we got the sawmill and encampment up and running again and we're getting very close to 
getting the mill in Saratoga so we can restore our uh, forest health before it all burns up. As we well know, that's a big issue right now. So uh, I would appreciate any uh, help you can give me in getting acquainted with the folks over in Rock River, and I intend to spend some time over there uh, trying to get acquainted with those folks. And so if you know anybody from over there, uh, let them know that I'm, uh, that I'm a candidate. I'm Kermit Brown. I'm running for House District 14. I want to thank the League of Women Voters who worked so hard to put this on. I want to thank the voters in uh, my district. Uh, I've just completed my eighth year in the legislature, four terms. Uh, I presently chair the Judiciary Committee and I co-chair the Select Committee on Natural Resource Funding, which is the overseer for the Wildlife Trust Fund. I've chaired the Wind Energy Committee uh, for two years and done a lot of uh, similar work in the legislature. I've sponsored a number of bills myself. The one I'm probably proudest of in the last session was one about insurance fraud, where we were finally able to break a law exam, if you can believe it, and, uh, and find a method by which law enforcement could talk to insurance companies and vice versa without somebody being sued for talking to the other person. I look forward to uh, running and uh, look forward to serving you for another term from House District 14. Thank you. And last but not least, Len Moniz. Oh, I can't. Oh, sorry. I'm leaving. I got it. No, we have two more. You're right. <laughs> My name is Glenn Moniz. Uh, I'm your current representative from House District 46. Uh, my wife and I are lifetime residents of the state of Wyoming and Albany County. Uh, my background is I was 26 plus years as a firefighter. Ten of those I was the Albany County Emergency Manager. I then purchased a feed store and run a successful business for 14 years. Uh, from there I am now, uh, have served in the legislature as your representative for the last four years. I know a little bit about government and government funding and how to run a government. I know a little about private business and, and how to meet a payroll and <coughs> provide health insurance for my employees. And I know a little bit about uh, the legislature and what it takes to work with the colleagues uh, to get some, some, something done in the legislature. I would appreciate your, your support and, and thank you. and I'm running as a Democrat for re-election in House District 13. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks to the League for, um, for this and for the other upcoming candidate forums. And thanks to the Boomerang for coverage and publication of the League surveys to candidates. A bit of background about me. I moved to Laramie just about 20 years ago to take a position as a faculty member at UW with a freshly minted PhD and a law degree. I arrived with my then partner and our six-year-old son, who we raised through the Laramie Public School System. I've served on several community and state boards, including the Territorial Park Advisory Committee, the Whiting High School Parent Council, and the SAFE Project. I've spent a lifetime committed to issues of social justice. For the past four years, I've been honored to serve in the legislature as an elected representative. I've worked hard on issues related to high-quality education, economic development with good jobs, and maintenance of our natural environment. I hope and think I've earned a reputation as a careful and thoughtful legislator who serves her constituents, the community, and state well. As you know, with the possibility, if not likelihood, of declining state revenues, the governor has called for an examination of an across-the-board 8% cut in spending. Of course, we all need to be efficient and prudent with our dollars. But I believe that we need to put the people of Wyoming at the center of our fiscal policies. This means maintenance and maybe even expansion of education, health care, economic development pursuits, and taking care of infrastructure. Roads, bridges, broadband, and perhaps in some communities, housing and daycare. In Albany County, it means that we continue our pursuit of a desperately needed new high school. We continue to examine how to protect the aquifer, and we maintain support for our county and city. 
Before we cut desperately needed services to our citizens and communities, we need to examine if and when we should tap into the $1.4 billion that we have in state reserves. These discussions are hard work. I believe it's time that we have those hard discussions, and I'd appreciate your support in the upcoming elections. Now I'm going to turn things over to our moderator, Jean Garrickson, who is a professor in I'll get, maybe I get this right, Global and Area Studies Program. <laughs> and you're going to have to tell us what that is when I read that. I always wanted to say you're part of international programs, right? Or international studies. No. Okay, see? You get to fill us in a little more there. And she will uh, do the questions for our candidates. And like I said, we have the two tonight. We have Ann Alexander and Phil Nicholas, who are both running for, uh, for the Republican seat in District 10. As Nancy said, I'm Jean Garrison with um, Professor of Political Science, which is, and with the Global and Area Studies Program at UW. But, but we're here tonight to hear more from our candidates. And so just as a reminder, as you have questions, they'll be brought up to me. So please feel free to, to be thinking of your questions. I would ask each of the candidates to just briefly introduce themselves. Um, and since your positions will be coming out in the context of questions, but if you'd like to briefly introduce yourselves um, once again and your background in Laramie and then we'll get going because we have quite a few questions already. I would start just simply because you are on my immediate left and start with Anne Alexander. I'm Anne Alexander uh, and I'm uh, as was indicated I'm a, the Repu a Republican candidate for Senate District 10 here in Albany County. Um, I moved to Wyoming in 1993 uh, to pursue my PhD in economics and Boy, they couldn't get rid of me, so I'm still here. Uh, and uh, I've got uh, all sorts of uh, wonderful experiences here, and I'm really, really looking forward to uh, having conversations with you over the course of the next few weeks as uh, we move into campaign season. And uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. My name is uh, Phil Nicholas. I'm uh, actually I grew up in uh, Lander, Wyoming. Uh, went to the uh, did my first school in Oregon State. Came back to UW for law school. After leaving law school, went to work for the Attorney General's office in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Within two years, my family and I moved to Laramie in 1980. We've been here ever since. I have a law firm now with uh, Jason Tangeman and others. Um, I've been now in the, uh, the House and the Senate a total of 16 years, eight years in the House and eight years in the Senate. I'm presently the uh, Vice President of the Senate Chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and uh, we've raised, uh, my wife and I have raised four children in Laramie. They've all gone to school um, in our Laramie schools. Um, they've uh, uh, gone to UW for their uh, bachelor's degrees, some of them for advanced degrees, and uh, we love Laramie. We've been here, and I'd like to uh, represent you for another four years. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, just as a reminder, each candidate will have um, 90 seconds to respond to each question. And given that I started with um, Anne on the introductions, I'd like to address this question first to Phil and then to Anne. Um, and there's a couple of, I'm going to be rewording these a little bit because they're similar questions uh, in some context. Um, a couple of people have asked under what conditions should the state use money? Sorry. Okay, can you now hear me? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the hazards of being tall. <laughs> um, a couple of different, uh, a couple of questions, but the gist is focusing on under what conditions should the state use money from the rainy day fund? Should that money go into um, risky investments? So the, the broader question is under what conditions would you use, uh, the, what is the triggering point for using the rainy day fund? The, uh, there is no set, uh, parameters of when we, we reach into the rainy day account, but when you look at how you access it and how much you access it, you have to determine how long your one is, when is a rainy day, when are you going to run out of money, and how long will you be down, if you will, in revenue and going to use it. When you look at $1.5 billion, 
Uh, we have experts out there now saying that natural gas prices could plateau at $4 an MCF for 10 years. If we plateau at that rate, we will hit a, um, that plateau in spending just in uh, ordinary growth within a couple of years. And if you are trying to access the funds at the rate of, um, oh, even a two or three hundred million dollars a year, you would run out pretty quickly. So the, the issue then, first issue then, is what constitutes a rainy day account? And we actually have some experience in that. The rainy day in all likelihood is when the general fund cannot pay for K-12 education. K-12 education is our first priority by constitutional requirement. If we lose another dollar in valuation in natural gas, the general fund will not be able to pay for K-12. That means you reach in. When I started the legislature, we were spending about $100 million a year just to fund K-12. If you do that, you know you're in dire straits because your first money comes out to pay for K-12. So the answer is, is we have to keep our eye on the, on the K-12 operational account. We have to be aware of it and have to figure out how long okay. we're going to have to sustain the lower revenues. Okay. Um, uh, the piece of that question was, do you, do you invest your rainy day fund in, uh, in risky investments? And, and I would say that that would probably be a, a, a very bad decision. But then again, that would be up to the state treasurer. Um, but uh, I think that uh, you know, we're, we're facing a situation where not all of our needs and wants can be met. Um, as Senator Nicholas pointed out, uh, natural gas prices have plateaued and, and may have uh, reached a point where they're not going to be increasing anytime soon. And for the past several years, uh, that had, the severance tax on natural gas has brought in about 50% or more of our severance tax revenues. Um, we're also going to be facing potential problems with coal severance uh, because of the fact that uh, they have provided slow and steady input for us as far as the severance revenues go, but we, uh, we may see some issues with the greenhouse gas legislation or uh, regulations that are upcoming. Um, I think what we need to do is, uh, when it comes to the rainy day fund, when it comes to budget decisions in general, is to think a little bit more strategically about what we need to invest in. And uh, those things to me seem to be infrastructure, education at all levels, uh, and uh, our workforce and business development. I'm not sure what the trigger is. There's no legal trigger, as the Senator has pointed out. Um, but to me, it seems that the, the bigger issue is to start looking at ways uh, that we can grow and uh, sustain the economy because we don't want to have to use the rainy day fund. The next question, will um, we'll start with um, Ann. Please explain your understanding of how the Affordable Care Act will or may impact Wyoming. Well, I see it an impact in Wyoming in, in a couple of ways. One is uh, if it uh, if it indeed continues uh, to be uh, to be the law of the land, uh, Medicaid expansion and healthcare exchanges. Uh, according to the Kaufman Foundation, uh, if we expand Medicaid, uh, that's going to cost the the state about 32 million dollars over the years uh, 2014 to 2019. Um, and about 19,000 people of the uninsured population would be covered under that. Um, whether that's worth it, I don't know. We would need to see a little bit more on the cost-benefit analysis as far as I'm concerned. The bigger, I think, uh, and more impressive piece of the Affordable Care Act is uh, the health care exchanges. We have about 90,000 people who are uninsured in the state. And according to a study that I did with a colleague at UW a couple years ago, um, we would uptake about 50 to 60,000 people who work for small businesses, businesses with people less than 50 employees, including self-employed people. Um, and to me, that is an extremely effective mechanism. It's a market where you will see uh, tax benefits going to uh, employers who have 50 or fewer employees. You'll see tax benefits going to the participants uh, who end up deciding to go into exchanges and you're going to wipe out about half of our uninsured population by pursuing exchanges that are well constructed. How those are constructed is going to be very, very interesting to watch. Oh. Thank you. Well, the, uh, there are a couple things with respect to the act that have an impact on Wyoming residents that are good things. I mean, we all agree that there ought to be portability of insurance and you ought to be able to get insurance that um, 
when you go from job to job, you shouldn't have to be uh, worried about uh, whether or not you can take your coverage or get new coverage. There, it's helpful to be able to have your children on your policies longer. There are some uh, number of things that will cost people more money, um, but those are things that are positive. And uh, as, we, as our delegation looks to uh, revamp it, it, it's called uh, having the opportunity. We certainly don't want to lose those good things. With respect to the fiscal impact on the state, it's uh, a little bit unclear. What you know is that there's going to be a Medicaid expansion as described. The, uh, the notion is at the beginning that those, that expansion would be uh, cost free to the states, that the feds would pay for that. The get difficulty is a couple areas. One is we know that those commitments are not long maintained, and uh, the, uh, so the state looks at picking up that cost. Right now, we're having a difficult time controlling our own costs and uh, of our existing Medicaid program, recognizing that most of those benefits go to our health care providers and uh, they actually go into our economy. So it, uh, it's a difficult thing to, to manage those dollars. But, uh, and then when you expand the Medicaid program in any um, instance, we always see and generally see greater utilization by um, folks that don't appreciate the, uh, the use of it. So each time, Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, um, beginning with, actually you get the mic, you get the mic again, Phil. Okay. Um, a little bit switch here. Uh, where is the new uh, Laramie High School in the queue for funding, and what is your strategy for getting the necessary funding? Well, the, the, the strategy was to place the, uh, the high school as the next up on the list. So we negotiated with the, our, principally our colleagues in Casper and around the state that uh, we would be the next in the queue if there's funding. The funding that goes into the uh, construction of the high school comes from a variety of sources, one including Coley's bonuses and uh, others, uh, other couple of sources. It's our hope that there will be sufficient funding to, uh, to appropriate the dollars for the high school next time. If we're unable to appropriate directly out, we need to negotiate with Casper to see if they will release some of their funds. They've got about a 10-year, five to six-year project, and uh, there may be an opportunity to address that. But in any event, you've got uh, uh, probably one to two budget cycles to, to fund it. The, uh, the principal uh, uh, strategy is to confer with folks around the state and make sure they understand the needs of the high school why we need it, how we need it, why it's important to convince them, as we have to get them in the first instance in there, that this is a high school that has reached the end of its lifespan. It is ready to be replaced, and it's cost effective. We have two issues with respect to its construction. One is obviously to secure the funding, and the second is to manage the construction dollars as they go out, consistent with resources around the state. We have to share the construction dollars with our colleagues around the state. We know that the STEM building is likely to be teed up the same time or the next year, and we have to Thank balance you. those. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can't say that I have much to add to what Senator Nicholas said. I think it, it comes down to um, being very aggressive about um, making sure that our need for that building uh, remains top priority. Uh, there are a, a lot of other places that would like to get uh, would like to get their schools uh, revamped and remodeled and uh, rebuilt, uh, but I, I think uh, there's really no question that our high school, uh, while it is full of fine people, is uh, as you pointed out near the end of its life and probably at the end of its life. And so I, I think it really does come down to being very aggressive about uh, working with your colleagues across the state uh, and making sure that the funding does come to us. Uh, next question, we'll start with Ann. Um, there are two that are very similar here, so I'm going to combine them. What are your views regarding marriage equality for same-sex couples and inclusion of gays and lesbians in, in, in anti-discrimination statutes? And it's also specifically focusing on domestic partners as well. Uh, well, to me, uh, the issue of same-sex civil unions, domestic partnerships, and so on, personally, is a matter of personal liberty and personal responsibility that people want to take for their loved ones. Um, however, I do believe that it is uh, my job if I'm elected to represent the views of my constituents. And therefore, 
should such issues come up during the legislative session, I would want to have some serious discussions with, uh, with my constituents to find out exactly how they feel about this and what they think is important for us to, uh, to do in the legislature. Um, I, I am what uh, you might call a uh, social libertarian. I believe that the government should probably not uh, intervene in the size of soda that I drink and probably not in some other of my personal decisions as well. Um, but I also believe that it is my responsibility to represent you and what you believe, not just my own personal beliefs. Oh. Well, thank you. you know, I've been called upon to make votes on this issue, and, and the, the line that I've, that I've supported is generally as follows. First of all, with respect to access to the courts, everybody should have access to the courts so that if you have a, a civil union, whether it's recognized as a, a formal entity or not, you should have access to the courts. Uh, our Constitution is very clear that everybody gets a, uh, uh, access to resolve their disputes and should be able to do those things. With respect to the definition of a marriage, I believe that a marriage is between a man and a woman. I believe that. I think that that, uh, that term in itself is, uh, is to be reserved to that relationship and not to be uh, kept to there. With respect to the formal recognitions of uh, civil union and statute, I've not gone that far. I just think that, frankly, fo folks, um, I think I agree with the libertarian stance that people ought to be able to live and let, let live. It's, uh, these are our friends, they're our cousins, they're the people that we know and love. But uh, that doesn't mean that the state is prepared to go out and recognize a formal relationship in the statute. But having to uh, provide those folks access to school courts is an important thing to do. Okay. Uh, we'll be, this question will start with you again. Uh, Phil, what is your position on liability reform and caps on damages? The, uh, once again, I've taken a pretty consistent uh, view that um, the Constitution is what it is. It says that uh, everybody should have access to the courts and that uh, the, the damages shouldn't be um, uh, regulated by the, uh, the state. Um, the voters have voted on this and uh, concluded that caps shouldn't be on or shouldn't be uh, imposed. We do have the unique area with respect to uh, medical liability and uh, the issue with regard to doctors, particularly with the potential for large awards where you have um, a bad baby case, for example, and that's something we have to continue to look at. It appears at this time that um, uh, liability insurance is both affordable and attainable for our physicians. We've helped them do that throughout the state. For that, uh, with that change, I think we should all be prepared to look at that and reevaluate it. But this time, I don't think there's a need to reevaluate it. Uh, I tend to agree on the medical liability cap that at this time because the, the damages that have been awarded in the state uh, have not been excessive that, uh, that there's no reason to, to look to make caps on, on uh, medical damages. Um, however, uh, a lot of good things happen in Wyoming because of the people that are here and not necessarily because, uh, because they're not possible. Uh, and so I agree that should the time come when perhaps we see except what might be considered excessive damages awarded that we would need to investigate. Um, uh, liability reform, caps on damages in general, again, I, I think that we, we don't need to put, uh, put too many restrictions on jury awards uh, unless they do become excessive as a matter of course. Okay. Um, I would ask both candidates to speak more directly into the mic again. We've had a request from the back of the room. Um, so beginning with you, we have, we have a series of questions focusing on um, sustainability and climate change and, and environmental, um, so I'm going to group them. Uh, the first is, is climate change happening? Are, are, human, uh, are humans substantially responsible and what should Wyoming be doing in this regard? Would you support the hiring of a state climatologist to fill the present vacancy? Yes, that's true. Uh, I believe that a state climatologist would be a, a good hire uh, if we are able to afford it under certain or under current budget conditions, um, and if we are able to to find somebody who, of course, uh, would love to live here in Wyoming and uh, and work with the state government. Um, 
when it comes to climate change and, and uh, these issues, I think what I, what I would like to say is that what Wyoming policymakers need to focus on is um, the problems at hand that we have. So uh, we have consequences that uh, we're not sure, some people will argue that they are human caused, some people will argue that they're not. Um, but I think what we need to focus on here is their, what we have at hand. Um, <clears throat> we have seen over the past uh, couple of weeks the consequences of having beetle kill and of having, uh, uh, let's just say, forest management policies that have not served uh, the state well. Uh, we need to look at having conversations with the Interior Department about sustainable timbering practices. We need to have conversations among ourselves about how we're going to harvest the beetle kill. And uh, we need to start thinking a little bit more about how we manage the ecosystems that we have up in, in the snowies and other areas around uh, Albany County because uh, these are ecosystems that aren't built for these kind of fires. And there are people who've lived here their entire lives, 70 years, 50 years, saying they've never seen it this dry, they've never seen it this hot, and they've never seen fires uh, do exactly what they've been doing. So I, I think we need to focus on the consequences and deal with those. Thank you. With respect to is climate. Could you please speak into the mic? Okay, okay. Yeah, how's that? That's, that's, better? that's, that's right. excellent, thank you. Not close enough. All right, with respect to uh, climate change, certainly we are having climate change. You, um, I grew up in the Wonder Border Rivers and uh, spent my youth in, on glaciers that don't exist any longer. It'd be uh, insane not to recognize that there is a change. The next issue is that human caused. Um, I happen to be one of those thing, persons that believe that frankly the, uh, it could be human caused, but the other side of it is, is that I don't think humans have as much impact on the world and the globe as they think they have. But it doesn't really make any difference. We, we sit in an environment where a lot of the uh, goals and objectives of those that have uh, are taken up the, um, the, the proposition or agreed the proposition that this is human cause and it's generally a CO2 problem, um, a carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases issues, a lot of the things that they are uh, advocating for are things that uh, we can be helpful too, we can clean up our environments, there's more that we can do. We are the largest coal producing uh, entity in the state, we have a social, or in the country, we have a social responsibility spending much of our money in coal research to, uh, research to reduce uh, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases. I think that's part of our, res our social responsibility because we do produce such coal. And I think, frankly, by do undertaking that responsibility, and putting money into carbon sequestration, um, trying to reduce greenhouse gases, is what helps convince our, our uh, colleagues and our friends around the United States that we do believe that there is a, a role for the Wyoming to take in terms of this reduction. Thank you. Um, uh, relatedly, these are two, two questions. Um, we'll begin with, and we'll be with you again, Phil. What is your definition of sustainability? And second, what is your position on the on the invasion of UN Agenda 21 into Wyoming counties. I'll repeat it. What is your definition of sustainability and what is your position on the invasion of the UN Agenda 21 into Wyoming counties? Well, I, I'll tell you, the, with respect to whether or not the UN Agenda 21 is a, um, a, an issue that Wyoming counties have to worry about and the county commissioners ought to be concerned about. Uh, I'm just not that worried about it. It's not something I go to sleep at night worried about. The, uh, with respect to whether or not the uh, county should be, um, uh, should be in invading into private property rights, I think that uh, the answer is no. I think the counties, we have uh, constitutional restraints. The counties should do is uh, only invade in the areas where there's clear public welfare concerns and they ought to do that based upon science. With respect to the sustainability, um, I think you're, that's a, referring to the budgetary issue, or do you think that's uh, part of the no, issue? No, I think, it, I think it's referring to the environmental context. Well, I think in the environmental context, the, um, it's, Our yeah. business, business environment, you know, the balance, I think, perhaps. All right. Well, I think the, ultimately, the, uh, regardless, you, I just came back from China, I spent uh, three or four trips there. You can see there how not to do it. 
we, uh, we have the opportunity to have uh, our businesses uh, grow at a time when uh, we can um, allow them to grow without a lot of governmental constraints. At the same time, we expect and demand that the businesses acknowledge and recognize that the reason we live in Wyoming is because we have a great environment, we have great uh, air quality, and we have a good quality of life, and we need to marry those concepts together. Well, to me, the definition of sustainability is what I guess uh, the old school folks in Wyoming would have called conservation, although I know that maybe has a different connotation now. And it essentially, to me, it means that we're using our resources in such a way that we get to enjoy them, uh, that we get to, uh, to use them, but we're also leaving them for the future generations and, and largely in the same condition, or at least it, with the ability to re-improve them uh, back to their original condition. Uh, so, for example, I think there is such a thing as sustainable foresting. I think there is such a thing as uh, sustainable hunting. I think there is, you know, they, they, these things are these things are possible. Um, with respect to Agenda 21, I've I've heard of uh, these issues. I know that they've uh, discussed it quite a bit bit up in Casper. I know there are people that have concerns about it, but uh, um, I think that Wyomingites are tough, and I think that. Uh, if you have a concern about that, uh, you will certainly let your voices be heard at uh, county commission uh, meetings and so on. And so I, I don't think we have to worry about uh, Agenda 21 taking over Wyoming. Um, this question is directed first to Ann. Please give us your take on the pavilion water issue. And do you support the state's elected official support of Encana? So I will repeat. So first, please give us your take on the pavilion water issue. And secondly, do you support the state's elected official support of Encana? Just writing it down, folks. And let, let me just say I will repeat a question for either of you at any time, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think that uh, it, the fracking issue, I believe, is essentially what, what this is coming down to. And um, I believe that uh, the science is, is still being done on this. I think that we need to all keep open minds at this point as to what the impacts of fracking is. Um, fracking has allowed this state and many other states uh, to have access to, to clean energy, cleaner energy, uh, and to, uh, to a sustainable domestic source of energy. Um, that said, all energy production has costs associated with it. And so, um, as putting on my economist hat, I think it's very important for us to know what the consequences are of fracking, and I think the science is still being done on that. Um, once we know what some of those consequences are, at least with a little more certainty, um, I think that, uh, that appropriate decisions can be made. I know that there was a, <clears throat> a, a political tussle uh, between the EPA and the states over uh, when different results should be released uh, from their water sampling. I know that uh, there were some, uh, some optics involved there that didn't look very good for all sorts of parties involved. And so I think what everybody needs to do is just take a step back, start over again, and uh, let the analysis be done by scientists and let the decisions be made based on evidence from that science. Thank you. You know, with respect to Pavilion, that's a tough issue. The, um, I grew up in the area, spent a lot of time in, um, uh, as a young man in uh, the Pavilion area. And it's an area where um, you, when you traveled through there, there was a lot of gas escaping. You could smell it as you went along. There was a soft dome there. It's unclear what role the fracking had in uh, generating that, but certainly you have families that now say that uh, their wells are affected. So. The, the next part of the question is, do you, what do you think about the state's support of Encana? You know, I've interviewed and uh, both the, uh, the uh, oil and gas conservation folks, the DEQ folks, and there is no bias towards Encana. There's a bias towards the science and a recognition that we do rely in large part to natural gas production, which has really been spawned by fracking techniques techniques. Without the fracking, we wouldn't have had the Jonah Field, we wouldn't have had the Pine Dale Anticline, we wouldn't have some wonderful things. So there is a balance. 
But having said that, when Tom Dahl, the oil and gas commissioner, was out of state and made some inappropriate comments, the, uh, the governor uh, largely in the, under his pressure him to uh, be fired. Tom Dahl was, a, frankly, was a, a good employee, but uh, in that respect, I supported the governor's uh, position. He had to do something, and uh, back in